afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for one of our uh, Black History Month lectures in African and African American Studies. I would like to thank uh, our speakers for today uh, for participating. Uh, um, this is a, uh, I'm really excited. So the, 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 the idea behind us doing this is to, to showcase and highlight you know, some of the fascinating work that our faculty members are engaged in. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speaker, uh, Associate Professor of History, Dr. Tunde <laughs> Odentan. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, the decolonization of medicine. Yes. And everyone for coming. I should thank those on the Zoom, the Zoom audience as well for here. Um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to share my research. This is what I've been working on for the past few years. And especially since COVID, audiences have been very rare. So if you get a chance to speak to people, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, so thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, I've been captured by uh, decolonization, uh, which has become in many ways a buzzword. Practically half of the conferences you hear about now has to do with decolonizing knowledge of these decolonizing. Uh, my interest has been um, in decolonizing knowledge. Much more broadly though, my scholarly interest has been focused on really knowing what happened you know, in the past. Understanding that the, the knowledge that runs the current world is not in my sense, it's not accurate. It does not explain its complexity. Um, so my role as a historian has been to, you know, just go back in the historical records and get a sense of what really happened. Um, doing so enables me to overcome the politics today. It enables me, I, I can you know, personally find it liberating, you know, transposing myself back to the 17th, 18th, 19th century, you know, is it? pattern of freedom, making myself imagine what I could have been at that point. If I was a slave, what kind of a slave was I? If I was a slaver, what kind of a person was I? I mean, all these factors kind of, you know, become very liberating for me. I think that's a way to think about history, to think about history in terms of what the past really was beyond what many vested interests needed to be today. Right? I argue that our politics today the way our society is organized today um, is um, organized around those who need to benefit for it, from it in, in very several ways. And it's not necessarily profitable for everyone. Um, back to the case of decolonization. You all remember the um, killing of um, George Floyd. Um, I, in the American context of this, it captured American attention. Uh, not simply because of the killing, which was not the first, in many of them. Uh, sadly, it has continued well past that, so it wasn't the end of it either. Um, but the brazenness and the use of state power in almost very legitimate ways by those who killed George Floyd. The only reason people think um, that there have been retributions is because there was a camera watching that. I'm blaring it not just to American audiences, but global audiences as well. Um, um, my interest in that was not just the American context of it, which is horrible enough for itself, but what it did to the global community. Um, it did not portray the United States in the best possible light. Um, it kind of reignited the discussions about you know, institutional racism in the US institutional racism in policing, uh, questions of citizenship, um, the way elections are conducted in the US, um, and political assets. Um, all of these questions began to be generated uh, following the killing of uh, George Floyd. Not that they had not been there before, but they, they became, I uh, argued that there was a global George Floyd movement that began, began afterwards. Um, for the history of medicine, a group of young medical students in universities in the UK, in universities in the US, began what was called the Global Health Decolonization Movement, in which they insisted 
in one particular college that they would not attend classes until their curriculum and syllabus was changed. That they needed much more equitable representation in their faculty and in those who taught them. You know. So that movement gathered steam. They began to organize seminars and conferences. Uh, they used the instruments of YouTube and other social media to project the ideas that the problem was not the individual killing of one black person or even an American crisis, but that the structure of our modern world rests on inequality in itself. That the structure, the way our modern society, not just in the US, was organized was in such a way that it defined some as belonging and some as being outside of society. Much more fundamentally, it invited academic disciplines to defend themselves as well, to defend what I call their bona fides as academic institutions. You know, our disciplines, our universities, our intellectual culture is predicated on people trusting us to be truthful, people trusting us to, 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 to be accurate, people trusting us to possess knowledge. And we do not just teach narrative, we claim to teach knowledge as well, knowledge upon which society is organized, knowledge upon which uh, society our politics is organized. Right? So academic disciplines began to be called upon to defend themselves. Um, in 2001, the American uh, Association of uh, Psychological Psychology, uh, I don't know the real terms now, uh, the American Association of uh, the Psychology or Anthropology actually offered a public statement as a group denouncing their heritage as an academic discipline, implicating themselves in the knowledge that has produced institutional racism, not just in the US, but globally. Okay, And they offered a public apology to that regard. Um, virtually every discipline in the discipline of history um, the American uh, Association, Historical Association, uh, devoted about two sessions uh, to decolonizing medicine. Quite a lot of roundtables uh, were set up to think in terms of how knowledge might be colonized, decolonized. The implication is that we recognize that the knowledge talk upon which our discipline is rest is faulted, or partly faulted, and altogether not accurate. Right? Part of the intriguing thing for me is looking at this talk of the library, okay, and seeing all the old books, including our faulted books that we do not replace, you know. So we keep them there, you know, as part. And my explanation for them is that power is systemic; it's enduring, even when it's found to be faulted. We it has a way of reinvigorating itself. Right? The stock of books in the library will still be there. That's where we still send our students to begin their research. That's where we still conduct our research. So in, in spite of our understanding of many weaknesses in our professional disciplines, academic disciplines, we still find um, the carryover of these uh, uh, challenges to academic equality, academic freedom. Um, I argue that the history of medicine actually became the 40, the last stronghold that needs to be decolonized, okay? Um, so many other disciplines had, in my argument, has been successfully, at least marginally successfully, comparatively successfully decolonized. Literature has been decolonized. Um, it's been taken from the Shakespearean traditions to understand it, so much so that the Nobel Prizes are won by non-European peoples, right? Not so much science or medicine. They have remained the very strong forties, if you may, of Western civilization. In other words, this is how far everything can go. We don't want to go this far. Um, so my interest has been in focusing on science and the need to decolonize science and think about how best to achieve that. There have been small gains, but there is a big picture that I think I argue that we need to focus. There are small gains in terms of much more affirmative action. Okay, there are small gains in terms of um, new political assets. There are small gains in terms of um, new recruitment of faculty, new recruitment of doctors. Um, Canada has actually last year made it a national policy to have inclusion and equity as a requirement for every government office. Anyone who is going to be employed anywhere in Canada, that government office has to demonstrate that there is no 
black person or minority who is equally qualified and was not. Um, our university has also made strides in creating an inclusion office and setting up an inclusion advocate to make sure that um, recruitment here um, has um, at least as far towards uh, equity and uh, as far towards equality. Now, in the medical field as well, there's been lots of um, sense of affirmative, affirmative action. Uh, there's been efforts to reform the syllabus, to move the syllabus from clinical practices, okay, which used to be the grand form of medical training. Doctors are supposed to be trained by their seniors. What their seniors do is what they should do. So we do have this continuous transference of a medical tradition that has continued. That syllabus is undergoing revisions now in medical institutions. To think of medicine much more broadly than um, this tradition of great doctors passing their skills into younger ones. Because coincidentally, those great doctors tend to be white men for the most part. Um, so we need to be aware of those small gains, but I will argue shortly that they really are very short to small gains and they do not go far enough towards achieving the purpose of decolonization. Um, bear with me, the, my slides will just quickly put together to organize my thoughts much more than be informative to, to uh, anyone. Um, so there, there are obvious reasons why we need to aspire to decolonize more. We know that much of our knowledge, not just in the US, but globally is still colonial. Um, it's still very imperialistic. It's half the basis for control rather than for knowledge. Yeah. This case has been made in the case of African history that I specialize in um, by Franz Fanon. Uh, Franz Fanon has said that the very essence of colonial relationship continues well past colonial rule and it's violent in itself. It disguised violence as not the instruments of pain only by, um, by violent tools, but um, in ideological ways as well. Valentino Mundimbe, actually Mbembe, quite a whole generation of scholars of African history have demonstrated that you know, the knowledge upon which we function is compromised already. There is just no way to write a history of Africa without having to deal with the colonial overarch, right? And this is how I see it. The European form, Western civilization has ascribed to itself all the best human values, right? So that science is automatically European. Technology is scientifically automatically European. Human rights, enlightenment is what Europeans do. All right? Whatever other people do becomes what Europeans do not do. The sense of otherness as framed as scholarship. So these scholars, among many others, underscore that there is no way you can write a history of African science. There is no way you can write a history of African technology. And it's not new. The Indian subaltern school um, reacting to Orientalism also made the case since the 1970s underscoring that every other people outside of the power of the European intellectual authority are set in a state of becoming, becoming not just fully themselves, but aspiring to become more European. Why? Because the European form has appropriated to itself all the best human characters and has the intellectual and political power to make it stick, to establish it. So the marginal successes we see in literature, in politics, in business and in wealth creation, often are successes in themselves, but often begin to be seen as people who worked carefully within the overarching system of European rule. Okay, so the best African businessmen are those working on Wall Street, which by definition is Western. Okay, the best African doctor are those working in European hospitals. The best uh, African academic are those working in European universities. Uh, and by European universities, I mean much more uh, racially um, than uh, territorially. Right? So again, my case is that, you know, even those marginal successes will not be found in science, will not be found in medicine. 
okay? The broad narratives which has continued to be um, the progression of Western civilization, okay? And it's right in most of those books that established Western civilization were written in the late 19th century. And what they did was project backwards to forever, such that the history of medicine was project backward to Hippocrates, you know, not because he was a doctor at the point, not because he was or any of the, the, the Renaissance or what medical doctors, but we began to say there were hospitals in Paris in the 14th century, in the 15th century. By any modern standards, those were not hospitals. Okay, they had no clear sense of explaining the black death. They died in huge numbers themselves. Like they did, we didn't even know about washing hands or the jumps theory until the, the turn of the 20th century. So to then project backwards and say, this is what Europeans have always done. It's in the European tradition. It's stretching the imagination and it's stretching science. So the question is, how do we overcome this overwhelming power? All right. Um, of course, there are the obvious things to do. Okay continue to campaign for the expansion of the legal frameworks, uh, legal framework, remove legal obstructions to progress, remove institutional bottlenecks, you know, to um, equity and inclusion. We can increase training. We can achieve and expand an affirmative action. Um, we can deracialize neighborhoods. So, you know, we can, there are lots of things that have been experimented with. Um, we can expand for voting rights. We can have definitions and discussions over citizenship, who belongs, who does not belong. We can imagine much more equitable financial and banking systems that is equitable to everyone. Um, we can have greater access to employment. Um, I particularly like the issue of hidden racism, you know, um, that has also come up in the discussions on overcoming uh, coloniality of, of knowledge and coloniality of social practices. The understanding that even some of those who claim to be non-racist have hidden biases that they need to overcome. So training helps. Um, but all of this sounds to me as keeping the fundamental structures of decolonization, okay, they sound to me like more palliatives than, you know, uprooting what we all recognize to be a fundamental problem, right? And the reason is, I argue is that power is dynamic and enduring, okay? And it has not ever in all of human history been willingly surrendered, all right? If we recognize that racism, or my preferred time for that is racialism rather than racism, but that's probably a conversation for another time. Uh, if we understand that racialism is the convention and we know it is hegemonic and we know it is horrible, it is bad, then I argue that it must be uprooted. It's not going to willingly surrender itself. People's privileges, people's conventions will not disappear. No one will give up their privileges. Uh, and sadly, society will not expand well in such a way as to include everyone on the same level. E equality will not be achieved, you know, until the roots of racism is uprooted. For the history of medicine, I argue that the solutions that have been advanced to overcome racism in medicine needs to, or they're valuable, but we need to go to the very root of medicine. Now, there's something I skipped, and I think is important. Excellent book by uh, Harriet Washington, you know, um, written in, published in 2006 or 16. Um, she kind of laid bare in the American case, how horrible the medical establishment is and how it's been built upon the appropriation of white bodies, the medicalization of white people, um, and how it accounts for the medical data that we have today. That life expectancy for black people is lower than average, that black women are likely to die three to one compared to white women for pregnancies, how the institution has sustained 
um, in spite of so-called marginal success in Greek. I should point that out. So how do we get to the root of coloniality of knowledge? And of course, in this case of medicine, I argue that most of this is happening in the 19th century and not before, all right? At which point we can begin to say medical, modern medicine evolved, all right? And the history of medicine, as it's been written and brought down well into the 28th and the 21st century, was based on what I described as the great doctor's thesis. It's how medical doctors are trained. The, if you go on the internet, on Wikipedia, you know, all you find about the history of modern medicine is great doctors in medical history. Okay, again, projecting backwards to uh, Greece um, in, in, in the BC. Uh, of a common era, um, you know. So the conventional forms of training included focusing on medical skills, um, included focusing on respect for great white men. The whole annals of the history of medicine is built around this racialized narrative, which is not absolutely inaccurate in itself. But broadly speaking, I'm able to demonstrate that it's a construction, it's a careful rendering. And what is a historical construction? A historical construction is a selective choice or choosing of data, all right, to tell particular stories. Not so much because there is no other evidence, there's no other information, but because historians have the power to, okay, to establish frameworks for limiting the scope of knowledge. Okay? So I argue that to overcome this, we need to aspire to that wider scope, wider context of medical knowledge. Okay. Put all these so-called great doctors in the context of their period. And a different story will emerge. All right? We will not just see them as great men in terms of their innovativeness. We will see them maybe as great men in terms of their honesty, okay? in terms of their genocidal implications in terms of the total picture of their being, even if we are focusing on great men. This is not the first time this has been done. The discipline of the social history of medicine evolved during the 1970s to challenge this very thesis, okay? That focusing on individual doctors and clinical skills that make those doctors appear superhuman, they invented this stuff, they did this great stuff, that focusing on them does not let us see the big picture of what medicine really is. Medicine is not just about great doctors. It's about patient experiences. It's about the social indices of medical practice. And it's only from 1973 that doctors began to interview their patients about their life histories. All right? It's only then, okay, what did you eat? Um, understanding poverty, understanding racial experiences. Now we've come to see medicine in much more broader scope than it really is. How long do I have? We have until 1.30, so. <laughs> uh, so the challenge for me has been that if we're going to de decolonize medicine, we need to overcome such narratives as this, as the great doctor's thesis. Unfortunately, even the social history of medicine could not overcome the idea that medicine is Western. It's unambiguous in the way this is presented, medicine is what Westerners do. All other people do alternative medicine. They do traditional medicine. Medicine is in the Western civilization and the history books and annals demonstrate that. The efforts to decolonize medicine, like I said, that was successful for literature, that was successful in politics, in business has met very serious resistance from the medical establishment. Um, Washington does demonstrate in her book, the first chapter is devoted to describing how difficult it was to even get information, how difficult it was to even interview doctors and people. It's also compradoral in many ways because doctors, including black doctors, are inducted into the system. So they become the great defenders of the medical tradition because it puts them at a pedestal, at least superior to other black people. At the conference on decolonizing medicine, the resolution was 
uh, carried by this author, um, Arthur Broadbent, um, in what I've called the Broadbent thesis. He says, the best way to decolonize medicine is to aspire to a much more inclusive medicine. What did he mean by that? He said medicine has to be much more culturally sensitive. That how doctors have treated black people and other people of color is really bad that they need to improve, right? But he said, whatever it is you do, medicine must not lose its scientific and objective basis of medical practice. Bear with me, usually I put AS in place of BS. <laughs> yeah, Makes sense of <laughs> where I think things are said to be. Um, but this is, this is a guardrail that keeps science and medical practice, you know, claims of being scientific, claims of being objective, because it reproduces the old tropes, old 19th century tropes of science is European. Other people cannot possibly be that. Other people cannot be rational. The enlightenment is European. Other people cannot be that. You know, all that Robert is asking for is some palliatives. You know, decolonization on the terms of colonial rule itself, on the terms of power. I argue that that has to be overcome. So. A more accurate history of medicine must recognize the origins of modern medicine itself. In other words, deconstruct the idea that Europeans have always practiced medicine, it is not true, okay? There was no modern medicine in the 15th century. The Black Death devastated communities. There was no knowledge. There was no modern medicine well into the 19th century. There was no, there were apothecaries, there were medicine merchants, there were all kinds of, the dominant explanation of medical practice well into the 19th century was holism, okay? Was humoral holism. That somehow disease happens as a consequence of disequilibrium with the environment. In other places that human gases or environmental gases make people sick. And everyone ascribed religious explanations to medicine. All the religious um, institutions have it. The Roman Catholic saint for illness. I know for smallpox is Nikai, right? You know, every religion has a patron saint of, of illness or of healing. I argue that medicine, that modern medicine, the point at which we should begin to write its origins was in the mid 19th century. At which point the technology increasingly began to be available. The global knowledge began to be available. The global reach for resources began to be available. Before then, there was a sense of despondency for illness. Well into the middle 19th century, smallpox killed people everywhere in the world. Smallpox killed people. Um, illnesses killed people everywhere in the world. Like I said, um, until the jam theory at the end of the century, um, there was no knowledge, even of basic bacteria and all of that. European physicians and their theories were not superior to any other part of the world. You know, they also shared religious inscriptions and explanations. And there was a global search for healing ideas and properties. In Africa, some of the earliest so-called explorers you know, um, in the rendering of the narrative, they, they call, in my class, I call them selfie people, right? You know, if you travel to a foreign place and you send reports back home, you're telling the story of, but these are the people that were used to justify colonial rule. Their writings were used to paint a picture of Africa, right? Explorers, the earliest of them were actually looking for medical properties to cure illnesses in Europe, to cure illnesses elsewhere. What then happened is when people travel as explorers, they meet with other guilds. Medical guilds were established in different places. Some of them were palace-based. Some of them were well-known herbalists or well-known medicine men. So a global network, which I think is inviting much more considerable research. A global network existed well into the 19th century of people traveling to distant places looking for healing properties um, for sicknesses. And then those medical guilds, well into the mid 19th century, were indiscriminate of men, of, of, of membership. 
they were not thinking in terms of someone is Asian or someone is African, therefore could not be a member of a guild. They traveled long distances, they were open to them. The history of medical institutions in Europe, including the United States, okay, was that it was open to anyone who was interested in studying surgery, anyone who was interested in studying medicine. Why? Because many of those institutions were poor. So they were looking for anyone who had money. So the defining characters of them was not race, it was wealth, it was money. If you could afford it, you were allowed to be there. So we had many African-American students in universities in Paris studying medicine because they could afford it. We had African students at the University of Edinburgh studying medicine because they could afford it. So there was a period in the history of medicine at where I call the very origins of it that it was not racial, it was open to anyone who could afford it and who was interested in being a medical doctor? Because at the early big period, of course, these disciplines were not particularly respected. All right. The stories about healers was that they couldn't even cure themselves, all right, that they were not very effective. So it was not a widely respected vocation. The origins of modern medicine needs to be placed from the middle of the 19th century onwards. Because that's when our medical institutions also evolved. That's when the Institute of Tropical Medicine is. That's when our university institutions, Johns Hopkins, I think, is the 1880s. Um, all the universities grew at that point. When the technology became available and um, faculties began to be created, at a particular moment in that history, it could not be racial. It was open to anyone who was willing and able and interested in studying medicine. Couple of years down the line, very close by, then saw the rise of scientific racism, all right? Which kind of undid the work that had been done the first years of the history of modern medicine, right? Because as medical technology became available, especially in the case of the American Civil War, as doctors were able to help cure those who were injured in war more, as their prestige grew, governments began to understand the value of medicine, uh, uh, of controlling medicine for social mobilization. Right? I argue that it's at that end that medicine became, increasingly became um, racialist, um, began organizing itself by excluding some. African of Halton helps me tell that story very well. Um, I've spoken about him, I've written about him as well. Um, formerly enslaved, was resettled in Sierra Leone um, as a recaptive. Um, he began his medical training with the British Army, uh, went to school with the CMS school, at graduate school, he seemed to be extremely very intelligent. He proceeds to England where he studies medicine. He's one of the first students, pioneer students. Um, he's well in the University of Edinburgh. Um, there, there, there is a monument in his name now. Um, Horton is not the only one. There are actually four black students there. There are two African-American students there. Um, there is a colleague of Horton, H. Davis as well there. Horton graduates, is employed immediately by the British Army to be the chief surgeon of the British forces in all of West Africa. What's interesting about Horton is he knows, Horton knows he's at, that he's at the very beginning of a revolutionary movement. Okay. He's conducting research the way other people are conducting research. He's aware of the literature that is written about medicine in the 1850s and the 1860s. He's writing correspondences to all of them. He's exchanging ideas. All his contemporary statements equal. He's voted as the head and the president of the Edinburgh City Association of Medics. That is that respected. We thought of him as a black person. Right? You will see that he changes his name later to Africa until in the 1880s when he began to feel racism. Right? But at the point when he was studying medicine and practicing medicine, he actually thought he was at the forefront of global achievement of science. Some of his inventions, he began to pack them by his day. So he would call decisions as something continuous, just like the other guys were doing, right? He thought he was doing, and he wasn't the only one. There was a whole guild of black medical doctors trained in Paris, trained in Belgium, trained in very different places um, who 
were engaged in this moment when history of medicine could not ever be called racial. Increasingly, Hutton gets employed in, uh, with the army. He is the chief surgeon who treats all the British forces in all of West Africa. He is involved in all the British wars. He is not conscious of himself as a racial character. He's not thinking of himself as, but increasingly he gets pushed out of service and discriminated against. Okay, at which point he calls himself African as Horton. He's forced out of service. Okay, um, tries his hand in business, he loses out and dies shortly afterwards. He's not the only one. Across all of West Africa, encounters between Africa and Europe is usually written in the literature as though it's a binary encounter. On the contrary, for more than four centuries, the Atlantic was a global highway of travel and commerce. All kinds of people who could travel there. Islam, it was a highway of Islam. It was a highway well into the Indian Ocean. It was a highway of global traffic between China and elsewhere. Right? Lots of mixture. That's why the Atlantic is seen as a constituency now. There's lots of movements and lots of mixtures going on. Many of them were indiscriminate of race. Ships, in spite of the slave trade, okay, ships will have black personnel. They will have black deputy captains. They will have all kinds of people. Uh, they will have healers. Whoever could provide healing um, was engaged to do that. Right. Liberia gets formed at about this period um, in the 19th century. And we see a movement of African-American doctors mm -hmm. to Liberia and to Sierra Leone and to other parts of Africa, mm -hmm. uh, at least the littoral region. What's happening is that in Africa itself, transformations are taking place. Governments are reforming themselves, such as the Ashanti Confederacy that forges itself out of the Ashanti Empire and tries to become a Republican state. <laughs> what the Fante did was to create departments of public health in the 1840s. They created departments of, they had modern doctors. The city of Lagos, well before its British bombardment, was already experimenting with the cure and vaccination for smallpox. We never write all of this in the history of medicine. Um, to save your time and not bore you with what I do too much. This is what I'm looking at. Okay, this transcontinental movement that transcends the categories we impose on them. Okay, that, that sees people as people. Um, ultimately, my hope is that the history of medicine becomes the history of humans rather than the history of races that I argue it currently is. So to conclude, I say that the way to decolonize medicine is to go back to that history, okay? To demonstrate that the origins of this very process was not racial, okay? To pull the rug, if you may, out of racialist narratives. What it does for Africans also, especially African medical students, um, is that it makes them know that they are not doing something outside of their skin, that they are not doing something against their nature. Okay? It's been proven that African medical students pay more to study medicine than their contemporary white students. Why? Because the expectation is that they have, to, they have to do more, they have to prove themselves more by underscoring that the history of medicine is what humans do and not what races do. They can liberate quite a few people. Questions, you can start hearing. So we, we might have questions from the, the quick on the, on the red, just quick on the red. Okay. No, don't move okay. off. Did we end it? I don't think I did. I, I think so. Oh, we're still there. Okay. Um, Questions. So I have a question for you. The um the so when I was thinking about, you know, there, there are all these discourses about, you know, whether it's sort of traditional healing knowledge and all that kind of stuff. How does that conversation intersect with the, the research that you're doing in terms of even the 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 black and African presence within 
the emergent European uh, sort of medical community? How does that intersect with the with the traditional healing and 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 things like that? I think it's an excellent question. One that, that I've had to engage. And this is where I become seen as working, if you think, um, <laughs> in many ways, and I think I have to. So, um, I think the idea of traditional African medicine is as historically inaccurate as claims of Western medicine. Right? And that's not a popular saying in African circles. Right? I think it evolved as a response to European claims to own Western medicine. If Europeans own Western medicine, we also have our own. Right? So that we begin to find what African medicine, if you look at the annals and the literature on so-called African medicine, you could almost negate it to the European one. All right. So where the European one has measurement, they will take pride in no measurement. Where the European one has some, they will uh, some so-called scientific forms. They will take pride in passion and closeness and community and stuff like that. So I argue that um, traditional African medicine is not a coherent corpus of knowledge. That's not to say it does not exist. Okay. What I think has been done is to begin to focus on what people do normally, mm -hmm. okay. find healing properties around them, okay? Try to eat properly, um, do exercises, you know, be around community, um, save from mental health crises and all that. Uh, and we, we impose labels on them. I, um, I know that I've had conversations with professors of, who focus on traditional African medicine here, and I'm usually, they are not here, that's why I can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> usually, I'm usually very much more slow having, having that conversation. But that, that's my sincere opinion that um, intellectually speaking, um, we could trace the literature when it evolved, it's often in response to this Western point. Mm. So, so, so you're talking about conceiving it not as sort of a, a medical institution as much as it's healing practices, global healing practices maybe would be a better way to think about it. Um, and then within that, it, and that's much more fluid in terms of there's a wide range of healing practices and thinking about maintaining yeah. health. Absolutely. I think it's circulatory also. Yeah. You know, people share ideas. One of the very interesting things is when COVID happened, how much ideas were shared about dealing with COVID than mm -hmm. taking the vaccine, right? You know, people had different, the internet was full of what you need to do, take lemon, do this and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Those ideas are shared mm -hmm. globally. I think there's a circulatory sense in, in global healing. It's also regional, okay? Because people use resources that and properties that are, that are close to them. Mm -hmm. What I think happened with modern medicine that began to be called Western medicine is that it achieved a transition using governmental power and resources to claim itself as the only authentic form. Mm -hmm. okay. And using governmental power to establish its profession such that the government would pay doctors the highest ever in practically any other discipline, right? We, our governments build the hospitals. We are all one sickness away from penury and poverty. So over the course of, since the late 19th century, you know, governments and this white collar medical establishment created the new guild with the collars and the dress and the titles and the universities and the institution. And that, that's the moving away for, and began to separate itself as the authentic form. Across the world, it then began to delegitimize the other ones, okay, <laughs> by calling them unscientific, evil, superstitious. And in Africa, governments actually put those medicine men and those who do those practices, put them in jail, killed mm -hmm. some of them, because just to establish this institutionalized form of medical practice. Um, over the course of the 20th century, as knowledge and money and technology became available, that institutionalized one um, kind of grew. You know, now we can afford to have um, the thermostat, and now we can afford to have um, the X-ray and stuff like that. Those are not traditional; they haven't always been there. They're very new inventions. Um, yeah. So, thank you for asking about traditional medicine. Still, I'm looking for the most sensitive way to tell all of Africa. Yes. <laughs> so, mine's not really a question as much as a comment, but your argument that the racialization of medicine happens late 
is really interesting as an early American, right? And thinking about the literature that has come in the last 20 years about the use of African, I think that's the right word, medicine in places like colonial South Carolina to deal with malaria, right? Is always told as a story about frivolization and hybridization. Some, you know, South Carolina is unique because it has such a large West African population early, and thus they figure out how to deal with malaria, for example. Um, and that's always as told in the story of sort of a very particular story of enslavement in the South. But in your sort of global context, it's in fact not that at all, right? It's in fact what's happening all around the world and all of, at, at this moment is this borrowing of medical knowledge from different places. So it's really interesting. I, you know, I don't, historians of slavery, I don't, don't tell the story that way. So I think that's interesting. Thank you. Um, well, I, I do think that we, 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 we search in our own place sometimes that we do not see yeah. those connections and movements. Um, there's also the very important story of Zidonesimus in Boston with smallpox. Yeah, very much so. um, in African circle, it's demonstrated and celebrated. This is Africa healing America. No, this is just someone who is knowledgeable about this sharing knowledge. Right, it's yeah. Around. And it's similar for in Western narratives. Edward Jenner invented the vaccination to know he got those ideas from an Indian maid who was working with him and stuff like that. That's what people do. Ideas circulate, share. Um, so thank you for noticing that. So um, this, this question comes from uh, someone who is a historian, but who is married to a physician, <laughs> who likes to gently tease me about our standards of evidence in history as compared to their standards of evidence in medicine. You know, medicine has this, you know, double blind controlled study as the gold standard of how they establish how effective a treatment is or whatever. I think Lots of physicians would accept your story absolutely without question up to a certain point and, and see that 19th century medicine, however you define it, isn't particularly effective or, you know, the, the European version of that that is establishing itself as the standard uh, wasn't particularly effective in what it tried to do. But at a certain point, I think they would push back and say, we do have this procedure whereby we can test treatments, whether they come from where, wherever they come from, we have a, a way of treating them. And they would say that, like, so there's a moment where I think this story, in the eyes of many physicians, even sympathetic to your story, would become uh, complicated. So, so what, is there a moment where um, certain kinds of medicine do you gain a claim on not legitimacy, but maybe effectiveness? Or, or is, is that not a, a reasonable way to see this? Um, I had the privilege of speaking at the Johns Hopkins Institute of Medicine last week. This was what I had to push back against. It's a question. So, what, in, in the hallway, I was speaking at the other pictures of the great doctors, right? You know, and all the big books and all of that there. And, you know, and I had people asking, are you saying that tradition should be, you know, thrown out and stuff like that? But, but the other point I was making is that I sympathize with you regarding your wife. <laughs> I'm going to be able to uh, help you offer a solution to uh, what you how to respond to that. But, but I, I kind of think this is what we do, right? You know, challenge the tropes, challenge conventions, you know, have, in many ways, have that tradition also defend itself mm -hmm. rather than just take it for granted. Um, I would argue, as I did at that point, that I have made my case, okay, that many of those things that were credited to pre 19th century, late 19th century science was what human beings do everywhere, including surgeries, including that's, that's what human beings do everywhere. And I'm able to provide evidence that in the Ottoman Empire, palace based clinicians traveled around the world as well, you know, collected information about healing properties, were aware of healing knowledges and practice them. You know, I'm able to offer that. I will not doubt that there will be a continuous tradition that can be traced back well before the 19th century, right? To European practices, to the, the, the hospitals in Paris, for instance, where you to, or even the university in Edinburgh, where the medical college uh, basically was a movement of the public 
this is an association on the university, right? So there's a long tradition that can be traced. But my argument would be that the point at which, if we're writing history at this point, what we call medicine must be separated from what's globally practiced. You, you know, um, again, I must recognize that I'm, I'm probably being driven by my own objective. And the objective being that if we want to decolonize medicine, we need to go to the point at which it became racial. The point at which it became racial argues when claims began to be projected backwards. You know, and many of the medical books are written in the 19th century. You know, and it's a historian writing that, yeah, this what we're doing now is in the traditions of the mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily because there's a direct linkage. It's old, it's kind of forced. I'm not sure it answers the question. So, this is as much of a question as just, you know, comment. Um, also, uh, this is, I heard this, and this is, I heard this on the internet. Like, don't, this could be completely <laughs> wrong. It was like a, so interesting. Um, I saw there was, uh, Historical evidence of um, African midwives perform, successfully performing C section in the early 1800s, sterilizing, like, you know, alcohol that they had. That just, you know, I feel like C section, if that happened, it was like, well, it happens. I feel like there's this in there as well. It's a, it's a good point. I, I, it's just been lots of medical innovative practices across the world, you know. Um, what the story you read does not say is the number of women who were C-sectioned and died. <laughs> and that has to be part of the story as well. But this, you know, so it's not just a celebrating one I'm interested in. The one we can use to claim, yeah, we got medicine. You know, it's a So medicine being what humans do, you know, uh, growing increasingly based on trial by error, you know, uh, based on, Standards that began to be set over time to measure compliance and stuff like that. I keep calling my opinion, I still remain convinced about it. It didn't come until the late 19th century. Um, in the British context of it, that's when the Institute of Medicine and Candidates. That's when it became institutionalized. That's when the government began to create bureaucracies around it. Not before. So, so um I I've been uh, realizing that um, country accepts Western medicine as the only way. So my question is, will there be a point where other medicines outside of the Western sphere will be accepted in our country? I mean, um, our country has dealt with um, slavery. Our country has dealt with segregation. And we're learning, our country learned from our mistakes of what the results are. Do you think that our country will be at this point where other um, med medicinal practices outside of the Western sphere will be practiced and will be included? It's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, but I, I'll say that the, the first step will be to overcome the idea that it's Western medicine. Mm -hmm. that it's, it's medicine. And what we call medicine, okay, shed of its Western potential, I call it, um, has always been cosmopolitan. It's always drawn resources from everywhere. Okay, a new segment of modern medical practice now is mental health. You know, and um, people are encouraged to do exercises more. You know, and many of those traditions come from Hindu Eastern religious traditions. You know, um, what's the one woman that we go to do? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, right? we, we do all of that. So, so it, it's always been part of it. It's, it's always been doctors appropriating resources and ideas from everywhere. You know, but the problem is the narrative, the story. Okay, we've been conditioned to think about this as West. Okay, and it's a claim. That's what I'm saying. So it's a claim we need to challenge. That's a way to overcome narratives of. This is my joke. It's a way to overcome narratives by uh, celebrating. When celebrities wear it in good shoes and say, I have the best shoe in the world, and show them your shoes as well. Your shoe is human, mine is human as well. You understand? <laughs> when celebrities take some like this is me, and the way to challenge power is like narrative. On the score that what to play. I'm not saying what.
We are just about out of time. So I would like to thank our speaker, thank the attendees, thank those folks on Zoom. One more round of applause. We have refreshments. Get a couple bottles of water.